So hello everyone, I'm Matthew Sample. I'm Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation at Leibniz University Hanover. Welcome to the inaugural event in our speaker series, Literary Imagination in Science, Tech and Society. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wen. she's waving, um, who's at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. She provided the theme for this series as well as used her connections to authors and poets mm -hmm. to bring together this really great list of speakers. So the motivation behind this series is a somewhat obvious fact, but it's a consequential one. Imagination and storytelling are a core part of science and technology. First, they enable science technology to even exist. That's by providing, as Mary Douglas would say, a cognitive schema that underpins the institution. They're also primary means by which technical practices come to have social meaning and impact outside of the lab, whether as miracles and emancipatory or as oppressive forms of violence. Recently, some scholars have responded to this um, by dabbling in science fiction, crafting counter imaginaries. You see this a lot increasingly, I think. But however, there are also many scholars who discovered the importance of imagination and narrative long ago and have made it their career to document the stories and imagined worlds of science and technology. Uh, moreover, novelists, authors, poets, essayists from many diverse ba backgrounds have been weaving narratives about science and tech and society, but these have been ignored largely within um, a lot of disciplines in, in the academy. So accordingly, this series, we bring together thinkers and writers, not only in academia, but also beyond to help us answer some pressing questions. How do collective narratives shape the impact of science and technology on our daily lives? And how can narrative be used to reimagine and reform institutional and cultural forms of science, despite ongoing connections to power and oppression? So with that sort of preamble, I'd like to mention some techn technology details. We have a live captioner. Um, and uh, we also have the registration open for the next event on our website and has put the link in the chat. We'll be meeting with uh, author Asako Serizawa about her book, The Inheritors. Everyone, uh, you're not allowed to unmute yourselves. However, um, we will be at collecting questions. You can send us questions via the chat and in the Q&A period after the talk, I'll collect them and we can sort of synthesize them and uh, ask Leah for her thoughts. For now, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Leah Ciaccarelli. She is full professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Washington, Seattle, where she also directs an interdisciplinary science, technology, and society studies graduate certificate program. Her research specialty is rhetoric of science. She's recipient of the National Communication Association's Douglas W. An Inger Distinguished Rhetorical Scholar Award and a number of other research awards for her articles and her two scholarly books. Uh, those are Shaping Science with Rhetoric and On the Frontier of Science. She co-edits a book series on the transdisciplinary rhetoric uh, and that's sponsored by the Rhetoric Society of America and Penn State University Press. So with that, I'd like to welcome Leah and um, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So does that look OK? Fantastic. So um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this speaker series on literary imagination and science, technology, and society. Uh, I'm just going to start with a um, a little disclaimer here. Uh, I study the rhetoric of science, uh, as, as was just uh, mentioned. Uh, rhetoric of science is similar to, but really distinct from, the field of study known as science and literature. So I'm not going to be talking about how scientist, scientists are uh, represented in novels or poetry or other forms of written fiction. Uh, and there's some and there really is some very good work being done in that area. Uh, here are a couple of recent books on the subject published by Johns Hopkins University Press and Penn State University Press, respectively. 
Now, the research that I've been doing lately is actually on how scientists are represented in other forms of public culture, such as popular movies and speeches and nonfiction books. But I, I think my findings align really well with the work of scholars who've looked at the figure of the scientist in literary fiction. And the upshot of that alignment is really telling. It, it helps to bring into focus an understanding of how the general public relates to science, creating an image of the scientist in the public imaginary. That image is one that I think scholars studying science, technology, and society would do really well to consider. So um, I began this line of research about 10 years ago when I started looking at how scientists represent themselves in public discourse. What I found was that through much of the 20th century, scientists embraced an image of themselves as pioneering heroes. In my book on the frontier of science published in 2013 by Michigan State University Press, I established that American scientists in particular favored such representations when speaking or writing to public audiences. We see this from Van Iver Bush's Science, The Endless Frontier, the report that spurred the foundation of the uh, NSF for US government funding of basic scientific research. Uh, we see it in biologist E.O. Wilson's image of the taxonomist as risk-taking bioprospector, mining rare species for hidden biological riches. And we see it in the analogy that Francis Collins re repeatedly made between the Human Genome Project and the uh, Lewis and Clark core of discovery. Again and again in my research for that book, I saw scientists representing themselves as the inheritors of a heroic pioneering ethos. Right, there you go. <laughs> Since completing my book on the frontier of science metaphor, I've turned my attention away from how scientists represent themselves in the public sphere to the way that non-scientists represent them in public arguments and in cinematic narratives and a somewhat different image has emerged. In today's talk, I'm gonna report on a number of studies I've completed over the last few years that examine the public image of the scientist. First, since I'm feeling in the Halloween spirit here at the end of October, I'm gonna start by talking about some work I did on the persona of the scientist in contemporary zombie apocalypse movies. Then I'm gonna tell you about a study I did uh, on something almost as scary, uh, George W. Bush's characterization of scientists in his presidential speeches. And then I'm gonna talk just a little bit about some work I've been doing on the concept of the scientist citizen, a promising persona that I've seen emerging in public discourse about scientists, but that I'd really like to see developed more fully. In each of these case studies, I found that the character of the scientist and the public imaginary can occupy the role of hero, but also fool, responsible leader, but also morally blind outsider. Knowing this range of identities can help scholars working in the Center for Ethics and Law and the Life Sciences promote the characteristics they'd like to see scientists cultivate going forward and to counter those that are most damaging. So the first study that I'm gonna summarize for you today is, that, is one that was published in the Spanish Science Studies Journal Metuda in 2015. And in this article, I argued that the glut of zombie movies infesting our theaters was at least partially inspired by the public's fear of viral apocalypse. In these movies, zombies are al almost always created from the release of a novel and highly infectious pathogen against which science has no vaccine or cure, a disease so dangerous and contagious that civilization collapses in its wake. Such movies, I think, reflect public anxiety about rapid advances in biomedical research, but also public fear about global pandemics. So how is the figure of the scientist represented in these movies? Now remember that uh, that book that I wrote argued that scientists construct their own public ethos through the figure of the pioneer as heroic, fiercely independent men who courageously enter new knowledge territory to stake a claim to what they discover out there on the frontiers of science. Now since the contemporary zombie movie bears a striking, stri strikingly similar resemblance to classic Western films, with gun-toting heroes facing off against hostile savages, 
How then does the figure of the scientist fit into those narratives? So I focused in particular on three popular zombie blockbusters, World War Z, 28 Day, Days Later, and I Am Legend. Uh, as German sociologist Peter Weingart points out, the ethos of the scientist developed through images, cliches, and metaphors in fiction films can tell us a great deal about the relationship between science and society. So what does the portrayal of the scientist in contemporary zombie movies tell us about the way we think about scientists in our modern world? Well, in World War Z, we see scientists represented as the opposite of the heroic frontiersmen. They appear only as clumsy and naive, ineffectual and dangerous to themselves and others. One scientist we meet is Dr. Fassbach, a young virologist from Harvard who initially is described as our best bet at overcoming the zombie pandemic that's swiftly overtaken the world. Now the real hero of the movie, United Nations investigator Jerry Lane, played by Brad Pitt, is skeptical, saying, he's just a kid. But against his better judgment, the reluctant gunslinger, Lane, is forced out of retirement to accompany the tender-footed young scientist into the dangerous zombie-filled wildlands. But as soon as they enter the danger zone, zombies attack. And in the virologist's rush to flee back into the safety of the military plane, he trips on the ramp and accidentally shoots himself in the head, dying instantly. <laughs> So much for the incompetent virus hunter, Dr. Fassbach. Towards the end of the movie, the audience is introduced to another scientist at a World Health Organization compound who is likewise characterized as dangerously clumsy. We see a video in which Dr. Spellman, the chief vaccinologist of the lab, contaminates himself with the virus by accidentally cutting his hand while working with a blood sample. He immediately turns into a zombie and then infects all 80 people working in his wing of the compound. And that's him uh, on the right there in zombie form staring down the movie's hero. So if World War Z presents the image of the scientist as blundering fool, the next movie I'm gonna, I, I looked at uh, in this study represents the closely related image of the scientist as victim unable to control the outcome of his own ethically compromised work. Both of these are popular archetypes of the scientist identified by science and literature scholar Rosalind Haynes. Uh, this is a theme introduced, um, oops, a little bit too fast there. This is a theme um, introduced uh, early in Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later, uh, which is a, a 2002 movie that was one of the first of the zombie pandemic flicks of the 21st century. At the very beginning of the film, three animal rights activists in ski masks break into a science lab where chimpanzees are being uh, subject, subjected to horrifying experiments. Uh, a scrawny scientist walks in on the activists as they prepare to free the animals and he stutters out a warning to them. He says, the chimps are infected. They're highly contagious. He then offers an unsolicited justification for his immoral treatment of these animals. He says, in order to cure, you must first understand. Well, it turns out that the chimps had been infected with rage, a virus that's passed through bodily fluids and causes the infected to violently attack the uninfected and thus pass the virus on to others. As soon as the activists release the chimp, uh, it attacks them and in moments they and the scientists are all rage infested as zombies. So scientists are being represented in these movies as naive buffoons and as immoral villains. What about that image of the scientist as frontier hero that scientists are so fond of presenting in their own public discourse? So that's where we get to the third popular movie here of the 21st century uh, uh, that uh, zombie flicks that constructs the ethos of scientists as something a little bit closer to how scientists like to represent themselves. The stereotype of the scientist as frontiersman exists in a cinematic merger of two other archetypes that Rosalind Haynes identifies in science fiction literature, the scientist as adventurer and the scientist as hero or savior of society. 
This vision of the scientist is found in I Am Legend, a 2007 blockbuster with Will Smith as the title character. Um, Robert Hay uh, Neville is the character's name and he is a world famous scientist who also happens to be a high ranking military officer with a ripped physique. Neville is the last uninfected man alive in a zombie infested New York City, where we first encounter him hunting deer in the abandoned and overgrown streets. He is the very image of the lonely frontiersman with a healthy respect for nature and the survival skills to avoid being caught by the bands of roving zombie savages that come out at night. But Neville is also a brilliant scientist with a well-equipped lab in which he works tirelessly in solitude to develop a serum that will kill the virus. When he identifies a promising compound, he captures a zombie to use as a test subject. Uh, we can see here a wall of, uh, that has previous um, photos of previous test subjects who've died in his care, which suggests that he's really been doing this for quite some time. In the end, Neville discovers a cure, but to preserve it, he has to sacrifice himself with a suicide run at the zombies who swarmed his lab. It's a martyrdom that saves an uninfected woman and child who are traveling through the city and who promise to get that cure out to the few remaining human survivors. With a beatific I'm listening that indicates his renewed faith in God, Neville, uh, um, Dr. Neville dedicates his death to the restoration of humanity and becomes the titular legend of the movie. Scientists everywhere can feel really proud of their heroic frontier avatar in the heavily muscled, courageous, self-sacrificing Neville. But there's a more complicated image of the scientist that got cut from the authoritative version of this movie. Um, I Am Legend did not always have the ending that I just described. In fact, it started with a very different narrative arc that didn't test well with audiences and was thus changed. But it was a version that was nonetheless popular enough that it can still be purchased as a separate um, disc or digital download advertised as the alternate theatrical version with controversial ending. In this version of the movie, Neville comes to realize that the zombie savages who've invaded his lab are there to rescue the test subject that he had strapped to the table and putatively cured. Through primal war cries and crude sign language, they convey to him that they want her back. Neville's statement that I'm listening is now a revelation that he has finally understood and respects their right to exist. He reinfects the test subject with the virus and lets her go. And with that act, he gives up on his attempts to assimilate her back into civilization and says, I'm sorry for what he now recognizes to be his own nearly genocidal acts over the last three years. Neville is a legend in this version of the movie too, but a legend in a bad way, a murderer of post-human zombies whose failure to listen to his test subjects resulted in a horrifying legacy of extermination. If you interpret the zombies in this movie metaphorically as so-called savages on the frontier wilderness, then this ending could reflect a dawning ambivalence in public culture about the American frontier myth and a concomitant recognition that scientists should act as self-reflexive ethical agents who don't pursue every research question they want to answer. A clear-eyed understanding of the legacy of frontier exploration means that scientists on the frontier of knowledge can't assume that it's their manifest destiny to cure everyone. Some people might not think they're sick at all, and listening to test subjects sometimes means freeing them from your single-minded experimental ends. The fact that this alternate version of the movie was abandoned when it tested poorly demonstrates that it's not popular in early 21st century society to see scientists in this way, right? They can be clumsy and dangerous or heroic and self-sacrificing, but not critically self-reflexive. 
However, the fact that this alternate ending lives on in video sales suggests that at least some of us are eager for such characterizations. The thoughtful ethical scientist may not be dominant in the public imaginary, but it's encouraging to see that this image isn't entirely absent from the stories we tell when we air our anxieties about both the reach and the limitations of our rapid advances in biomedical science. All right, so the second study uh, that I am gonna summarize for you today was written for a scholarly collection on presidential rhetoric. Uh, and I decided to look at the figure of the scientist in the presidential speeches of George W. Bush because his administration was notorious for exhibiting a dangerously cavalier attitude towards science. Now, it's hard to fully appreciate this in the wake of Donald Trump's devastating war on the truth, but George W. Bush really did set the stage for it by leading his own Republican war on science. Towards the end of his first term, the Union of Concerned Scientists released a report and petition signed by more than 15,000 scientists condemning the Bush administration's manipulation, suppression, and misrepresentation of science. And both journalists and historians who interviewed White House insiders from his terms of office reported the presence of a contemptuous attitude towards scientific expertise in his administration. Before uh, Bush Jr., almost every American president since Calvin Coolidge had used the frontier of science metaphor to invest scientists with an American pioneering spirit, creating an official presidential characterization of scientists as heroes who conquer new knowledge territory and lead us to a brighter future. So how did George W. Bush manage to buck this, uh, this conventional presidential performative tradition? Well, he did not um, avoid it altogether. He just altered it. When he spoke to scientists at uh, traditional awards uh, ceremonies, he added something to the familiar pioneering ethos that's usually uh, evoked in ritual speeches like this. In four of the six speeches he gave at national medals ceremonies where he was awarding medals to scientists, he suggested that scientists were not only pioneers, but prophets as well. The most striking example of that was in his first such speech in 2002 when he said, our honorees are the prophets of a better age, seeing the future before a lot of folks don't see the present. Um, okay, so the, the flub at the end of that sentence, authentic Bushism, right? It's awkward, confused, there's no surprise there. But the prophets of a better age, that phrasing at the beginning of the sentence actually has a, a, a touch of eloquence to it. Scientists are being depicted here um, as uh, having the ability to communicate with the divine to foresee the future. In addition, they're either doing so in an era that's better than the one in which the old prophets lived, or they're prophesizing a better age to come. Either way, uh, it marks the scientific prophets as improvements on some, in some way on the prophets of old. Now, I was a little puzzled by that language at first, right? The prophet metaphor seems to be an odd way of talking about scientists if you're a deeply religious man and you're supposedly waging a Republican war on science. After all, those who have a cavalier attitude or a dismissive attitude towards prophets do so at their own peril. Equating scientists with prophets and then ignoring their advice like Bush did would seem to be setting the stage for tragedy. But I think it'll become clear in a moment here, the puzzle of this language choice is resolved when we consider it in light of Bush's characterizations of scientists in his other speeches. In his policy speeches, the 43rd president's characterizations of scientists portrayed them as false prophets. In his speeches about climate change, Bush portrayed scientists in a way that manufactured uncertainty in the public sphere. And in speeches about stem cell research and cloning, he depicted scientists as so lacking in virtue that they're likely to drag the nation headlong into a dystopian future, if not restrained from doing so. In short, his policy speeches created a befuddled or morally deficient persona for scientists, what I'm calling the false prophet 
For example, consider Bush's first major presidential speech on global climate change. On the eve of a trip to Europe, where he knew he would, was going to have to defend his decision to reject the Kyoto Treaty on Carbon Emissions, he offered a lengthy discussion of what is not known on the science of climate change. Scientists are depicted in this speech as offering a wide spectrum of views and proposing many theories and suppositions. Uh, an anaphora repeating the phrase, we do not know, sets out three things that the National Academy of Sciences can't say about climate change, including the degree to which warming is a result of nat natural fluctuations rather than human activity, and the amount as well as the speed of change. Bush reminds his audience that no one can say with any certainty what level of warming is dangerous, a statement that's repeated later in the speech, but no one knows. And the word scientific is never used as a modifier to signal the credibility of evidence or a claim. Instead, it appears only as an adjective before the word uncertainties. If one were to sketch an image of what a scientist is from how they're portrayed in this speech, it would be someone plagued with doubts uh, and failures of knowledge. By portraying scientists as uncertain and in disagreement, Bush was adopting a rhetorical strategy that's in line with political consultant Frank Luntz's recommendation that Republicans delay regulatory action on carbon emissions by exploiting the public's mistaken belief that there's no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. The political, this political rationale he has for characterizing scientists as uncertain explains why Bush identified scientists as prophets rather than just pioneers in his cer ceremonial speeches. The true prophet is a visionary who's certain about what God has revealed. Uncertainty in a prophet or disputes among prophets are signs that we're in the presence of false prophecy that shouldn't be used to guide policy decisions. Of course, another way of thinking about a false prophet is to see him or her as being in league with the devil. That alternative was suggested in George W. Bush's speeches on stem cell research and human cloning, where the scientist is portrayed as an immoral agent who, if unrestrained, could lead to a dystopian future. Consider, for example, a speech he gave in 2002 on human cloning, where Bush proclaimed that human cloning has moved from science fiction into science. As the speech continues, it becomes clear that it's a dystopian science fiction scene that he's evoking. As he explains, there are scientists who are producing embryonic human clones for research purposes, who are combining human DNA and rabbit eggs, and who announced plans to produce cloned children, despite the fact that laboratory cloning of animals has led to spontaneous abortions and terrible, terrible abnormalities. This litany of moral crimes committed by scientists paints them as frightening characters in a horror story. According to Bush, science now presses forward the issue of human cloning. Unlike the president and most Americans, scientists don't find human cloning deeply troubling, uh, implies Bush. But since the president is guided by human conscience, he is going to press back. He insists that allowing cloning would be taking a significant step towards a society in which human beings are grown for um, uh, grown for spare body parts and children are engineered to custom specifications and that's not acceptable. Uh, the scientists introduced in the speech are dangerously lacking in compassion. They're the sort of people who don't see children as gifts to be loved and protected, but as products to be designed and manufactured. They see life itself as a commodity. In, in response to that, the president, who of course is a moral and religious man, tells a story of himself standing up against these scientists with the restraint of a human cloning ban. Now, if we contrast Bush's speech with that of an earlier president, we can see that this rhetorical approach is not the only way to take a stand against human cloning. In early 1998, President 
uh, Bill Clinton banned the use of federal, federal funds for human cloning and called on Congress to adopt a ban on human cloning itself. But in the speeches that he gave explaining his position, he didn't pit scientists against human conscience and compassion, nor did he represent himself as constraining a dangerously immoral scientific community. Instead, he characterized scientists and moral leaders as united. As he put it in his 1998 State of the Union address, we must ratify the ethical consensus of the scientific and religious communities and ban the clon cloning of human beings. In this story that Clinton tells, scientists are aligned with ethicists and with the president himself. They aren't pressing the issue of human cloning forward, or, but are themselves calling for a ban. This is a vision of the scientists that stands, I think, in stark contrast to the vision that George W. Bush offered. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, more in line uh, with the uh, vision of Neville from the alternate ending version of I Am Legend, right? He's a, a, they're they're self-reflexive researchers making ethical decisions about when to stop pushing forward on the frontiers of science. And it's that vision of scientists that I'd like to further develop in the concluding moments of my talk today. I'm gonna to briefly introduce another paper that I wrote recently. It's on the figure of the scientist in Naomi Klein's call for climate action in her book, This Changes Everything. Uh, and also in an earlier press article she wrote on the same subject. The ethical scientist citizens that I tease out of my engagement with her work, I think can stand with Clinton's ethical scientists and the alternate ending enlightened Neville as models for the moral instruction of scientists, a vision of the scientist in the public imaginary that I think is worth cultivating. So in my essay on Klein, I critique her book for characterizing scientists in two ways only, as the silenced victim of corporate power or as villains who are hopelessly tied to an extractivist mindset. It's a pretty bleak portrait of scientists as either weak or evil, <laughs> matching really what we saw in those first two zombie movies I discussed earlier. Klein tells the story of researchers who are effectively silenced by the devious tactics of the carbon extraction industries and as mad scientists who take advantage of the climate crisis by swooping in with frightening solutions such as geoengineering that play off of the magical thinking of a public desperate for climate solutions that adhere to market logics. She critiques Bruno Latour's charge to scientists to stop being like Dr. Frankenstein and to instead love your monsters uh, by protesting that Frankenstein's monster is a metaphor for geoengineering, a horror that Klein says can't be loved and must be stopped. I think she has Latour's metaphor wrong here. Latour has nothing good to say about geoengineering. His argument instead is that scientists need to take responsibility for their technological creations. Unlike Dr. Frankenstein, who turned away in disgust from the monster he created, scientists must take responsibility for the criminal acts of their inventions, like the combustion engine, and raise them to be more virtuous agents. The scientists who develop renewable energy technologies, I think, are doing just that, as are the scientists who take on an activist role in the public sphere to inform others of the dire state of the environment. They're building a better science, a more attuned science, a less simplistic, more complex, human scaled science that privileges adaptability, ecological balance, and the care for our creations. It's these scientists that I think Klein forgets in her book, but that she praises in an earlier article that she wrote for the New Statesman, where she offers a more positive role for scientists to take in the public sphere. She calls the scientists that she features in this article the new scientific revolutionaries. Now they may be participating in a kind of Kuhnian scientific revolution in the technical sphere, but they're also activists fighting a political revolution against the extractivist industries, using their expertise to fulfill their citizenship duty in public forums 
by advocating for policies that serve the public good. I develop that characterization of the rhetorically savvy scientist citizen further in an article that I co-authored on the Lakula 7. And now I'm, I feel like I'm out of time here. So I, I'm just gonna state the thesis of this piece very quickly, uh, that the first judicial decision in the court case in Italy interpolated the figure of the responsible scientist citizen, an expert with a positive duty to communicate specialized knowledge in the public sphere. Now, later rulings in that case in the appeals drew a curtain between the technical sphere and the public sphere. They imagined the scientist as properly cordoned off in a professional zone. But at least for one moment in the development of this case, we saw a flash in the public imaginary of scientific, uh, scientific persona expected to thoughtfully consider uh, obligations the, the scientist's obligations to the larger public, uh, a, a scientist, scientist who uh, acts as a good citizen. Like that alternate ending Robert Neville, scientists are expected to halt their narrow-minded explorations of the frontiers of knowledge and think about the implications of their actions on the non-scientists around them. It's a vision of the scientist that I think is hard to imagine when you watch George W. Bush or the producers of the typical zombie movie, um, when we see scientists portrayed as confused, clumsy, or morally deficient agents of our destruction. But I think it's a vision that holds promise for a better future. And it's one that I'm gonna continue to promote in my work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah.